Oh, pleasure. Good to be here. Good afternoon. I'm going to give you an overview of the NASA Real-Time Mission Monitor. It's a, it's a tool that uh, we've developed at a NASA Marshall Space Flight Center for conducting uh, and facilitating field experiments. Uh, first of all, I'd like to uh, acknowledge the people who have been involved in the development of this. It's uh, Richard Blakesley. He's the PI. I'm the, the co-I. And we've had some excellent work done with, by John Hall, Philip Parker, and Matt Heath. These are some of the software developers. And then support from headquarters. You can see the program managers that have provided us with some funding. And then we've worked very closely with NASA Dryden, particularly with Larry Freudinger. We utilize their communications backbone to transmit the data from the plane uh, to the ground and from the ground up to the plane. And I'll uh, explain this as well as working with uh, the NASA Ames uh, Earth Science Project Office and all the airborne and instrument scientists that we've worked with on all the field experiments. So what is the real-time mission monitor? Well, it's an interactive visualization tool that allows you to be aware of the situation where the, all your assets are in and enables you to make strategic and adaptive decisions right on the fly. So we are able to integrate satellite data, aircraft data, surface data sets. We can display models and, uh, and, and their forecast parameters, as well as the tracking the, the, the state of the, the airborne vehicle. So everything is displayed in one um, visualization parameter. So what we're able to do is, we're, it, because of that, it really is very useful in all three phases of a field experiment, from both the pre-flight planning of a mission, uh, where you're looking at trying to decide the, the flights. Since uh, NAMA, we've been able to develop an interactive waypoint tool. Of course, you can, you can then uh, coordinate that with predictive satellite overpass. So, you know, I've got to put that airplane right here at the same time the satellite's overflying. During the flight, of course, you're aware of where all your assets are, and, you're, and we are even working on some plane-to-plane -plane data transfers. More, what we've done so far quite often is ground-to-plane and plane-to-ground, and now we're working on plane-to-plane. -plane. And, of course, in post-flight and post-mission, you're able to play back these missions, and you'll see some movies in just a moment. So who uses it? Well, really anyone can use it. You've got mission scientists on the plane, so we have a real-time mission monitor on the plane. You have people on the ground above the ops center, at headquarters or whatever the program managers may be. You can have educators and students, anyone who has internet access and, of course, the secret password, which we, uh, so we, we don't let everyone in the world get onto it. And so and it enables these interactions and collaborations in near real time. And, and that's what's really the strength of it. And so it was, it was, it was used both in NAMA and TC4. And, uh, and I'll sh in fact, here's the history of the real-time mission monitor. It started out with some uh, heritage system uh, during the Altus Cumulus Electrification Experiment. Um, and it was just kind of a standalone Java-based uh, system. And they did some improvements in, for TCSP experiment in 2005. In 2006 was its current instantiation where we're utilizing Google Earth as the visualization um, engine. Um, and during, during uh, you'll see a movie, we just um, we had one plane, the DC-8. But in 2007, we supported the uh, TC-4 experiment and were able to track three planes simultaneously. And then we even did the Hurricane Arisond in, in the end of 2007, November 2007. And just two weeks ago, we supported the Arctis field experiment up in Fairbanks, Alaska. And there's a summer version of that in Cold Lake, Alberta. And I'm headed up uh, there in uh, June to support Arctis. So what are, we, what are we able to bring into? Well, we can bring in all sorts of uh, satellite data. We've displayed goes 12, 11, 10, Mediasat. This is all in real time or near real time. We have MODIS data, both uh, products and the viz and infrared. Uh, we're bringing IR composites and, of course, the satellite field of view, uh, predictive NATO tracks, and the instrument field of views. Uh, aircraft data, there you can see the list of aircraft we've tracked so far, the DC-8, the ER-2, W-57, the NOAA P-3, and the NASA P-3, uh, the NASA B-200, the Department of Energy Convair 580, and an aerosond. We've gotten uh, drop sound information. Uh, and we're able to transfer data, quick looks from the plane to the ground, and vice versa. Surface networks, lightning data, radar data, uh, and radio songs, and we've also displayed FSU uh, work model during Arctis, 
and the GS5 uh, weather forecast model we've done. So all these things can be brought in. Uh, and so what enables it? Well, it is Google Earth, and people say, oh, we're just using Google Earth. Well, Google Earth is, I mean, it is a mashup, but what you're seeing is just an example of all the, no all the connections you need to do to bring all the data in. So for NAMA, we had, we had computers on, and uh, systems on the DC-8, we had in Cape Verde, we had in Dryden, at NASA Marshall, all these things. So you have to know, the work behind real-time mission monitors is to be able to know where the data is, how to get it. So here's a screenshot of a typical uh, Google Earth display using with the real-time mission monitor. On the left-hand side, you see the uh, menu selection uh, and it's a series of uh, menus that open up and you point and click. And here you can just see a, a flight track and a radar image from TC4. This is Costa Rica. And uh, you can see there's lightning data. And uh, I'll show a few more things in just a moment. Another aspect of the real-time mission monitor is that we, can collect, we also utilize instant messaging. And so that's really, really powerful. Once, if you have that visualization of the real-time mission monitor, and then you bring up an instant messaging window, and now you're able to communicate. So here's, just another, here's another spaghetti diagram, and this is the post-mission you're able to display. These were all the NAMA flights during, uh, and you can see the, 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 the uh, here right here is the, these are the transit flights in and out, and then these are all the science flights, including flights out over uh, Mauritania and uh, West Africa. So this is an example of all these different layers you can click on or off. Now here's a, and here's a movie. This is uh, when um, the flight over Tropical Storm Helene, actually, actually I think it was a depression at the time and subsequently became Helene. You see the zoom in set. Uh, the, the plane is about to take off. Here we go. Heading down the runway. See the icon. Up here, is, this is a um, altitude chart. You can see the plane beginning to, to lift off. This green figure eight is the plan track, the waypoint track. You can see uh, lightning. And of course, this is an infrared image, media stat. Notice that the plane uh, turns a corner here. It avoids an intense light uh, cell, veers around. Of course, now we're speeding things up. We're 300 times faster than, uh, than real time. Plane comes around, and the, the red arrow, I mean, red flags are drop zones and drop zones. You can bring that data in. As it rounds the corner, you're going to notice a, a, a green and red uh, shading go by right here. If you can see that there, that's a TMI overpass. So you get no other information. You know that the aircraft uh, underflew the TMI. So right now, we're bringing all this in up here with the uh, track. You can see the plane is doing some ascents and doing some porpoising. Through the, atmos uh, through the atmosphere. It's going to come up and uh, in a minute it's going to do some spirals. So all this, as I said, I mean in real time you're just seeing that plane inch along. Uh, and here you can see the spiral, the plane is doing an ascent. And off it goes and uh, does some more. Along that you can see time advancing along the bottom here. So uh, things are moving rather quickly here. Once again, the plane is uh, different altitude tracks. And I'm just going to let it run a little bit longer. Uh, Ed mentioned how the plane was struck by lightning. Well, you're not going to see the lightning flash here that actually struck the plane, but it was right about here, the plane. So I'm going to end the movie here and move on to the next little movie. OK, this is TC4. Now we're in uh, Costa Rica, 2007. Now we've got three airplanes flying. So along the track, you see the, the track of the, uh, this. now we also have the pitch and roll, that's what the magenta is. So now you see three airplanes. And here's, here's what really makes this powerful, is we're, they're trying to stack all three aircraft simultaneously. And so you have the ER, uh, ER-2 flying about 65,000 feet, the WV-57 flying about in the 50s, 52, and the DC-8 around 40,000 feet. And so on the fly, uh, David Starr is making decisions. Okay, we've got to cut this plane off here. We want to fly all three planes in a stack formation. And uh, so you can see here's the, you can see the results. So, now the jerkiness, of course, is just an artifact of making the movie. But you know, the all three planes they different have different flight times. So you can see that the W57 is returning. The ER2 continues to work this line of convection. And the DC8 is going off to fly uh, over Columbia and catch some volcanic emissions. Because uh, this is an atmosphere composition movie. 
Okay, and uh, so now you can see that the uh, ER2 has landed or about to land, and the uh, DCA continues to fly. We move on to next. I mentioned we flew the Aerosond. Now the Aerosond, this this is a little small plane. You know, those of you familiar with the Aerosond, it's about the length of a table. It's a UAV. This is a mission that flew for on for 20 hours, so we really got this thing speeded up. And you notice that this icon is really jiggling around a lot. And that's what we believe is uh, is that that's really being buffeted by the wind. You know, it's such a small little thing; it's being buffeted, and so the 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 it's constantly being. Uh, uh, buffeted by the winds, and so here it is, and flying into the uh, here's a Hurricane Noel down here. Uh, they ditched the plane. The purpose of this does not return. So after it flew about 20 hours, they just ditched it into the water. Here you get <laughs> and there's all these little flashes down here. There's lightning. So uh, in the interest of time, I'm going to have to move on. Uh, okay, I mentioned Arcus. We just got back from uh, Fairbanks, Alaska. And on this particular flight, we had the DC-8 and the P-3, and you're going to see the, uh, the B-200. The DC-8 is uh, flying out of Iqbalit, uh Canada, Northern Territories, and the um, uh, P-3 is flying out of um, Thule, Greenland. And uh, you see these little, uh, what you're going to see is these, the satellite overpasses. So you're going to see, uh, here comes the Terra Modis. So there's the pass there. And then here's the A train, here's the answer E, and following behind it is the uh, OMI footprint. And so uh, the, the planes are going to meet up in Point Barrow here, and that's where the B-200 uh, is going to take off from. So, you know, what, was, what, what I'm showing you is that you know, no matter where you are, in the tropics or in the, uh, in the Arctic, it doesn't matter. Uh, we, can, we can capture that information and display it. And uh, well, I have to emphasize that people on the plane are seeing the same thing as those of you on the ground. It's a really powerful tool. And now you can see that the, uh, the B-200 uh, and the DC-8 have hooked up and they're going to continue to fly on down around and the, um, down here, the uh, P-3, the NASA P-3 has uh, landed in Fairbanks. Okay, and I'm just going to end that movie. So where are we going in the future? Well, we want to add uh, some more satellite imagery. We, did, we were able to bring the MODIS data in. We'd like to start bringing another data set to cover the, the airs. We want to, what you saw was an example of movie generation. We want to speed that process up, make it a little bit easier, improve the playback, improve some of the user data uh, selection menus, uh, and as well as bring in some capabilities with the sensor web. And then I mentioned that we've got a waypoint, uh, interactive waypoint generation tool. That was always a kind of a hard thing over the past couple of years, is the past couple of experiments, is getting that information in to the, um, the real-time mission model, all the different flight plans. And so we've, we've got a good tool for that uh, that we, we're going to demonstrate in uh, the summer. It's a Java tool, but it, it works well with, uh, with the real-time mission monitor. It's just a point and click. It has all the information about the flight speeds of the, of the aircraft, and you can drag, and, and you can also have uh, satellite. Uh, orbits, uh, predict, so you can, uh, and, and the bottom line is that you can then plan your mission as when the, when the more easily plan the, where the airplane and the um, satellites will be. And then you can then feed that directly into the real-time mission monitor. So uh, if you want to go back and do some of these playbacks, we have them online at uh, uh, the uh, website at rtmm.nsstc.nasa.gov. And... Um, We'll uh, welcome uh, any interaction, and uh, I'll take t uh, questions at this time. Thank you very much. Uh,